All right, Doc, we're in the third segment here. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to talk about healthy food may not be appealing, right? Yeah. Because sometimes even with us, there's healthy stuff that we can eat. Um, it just doesn't taste as good as pie and, uh, I don't know, egg McMuffins. I don't know. <laughs> it, it just doesn't taste the same. Well, we're talking about taste buds, I think. Yeah. And our taste buds are very, you know, more extensive and developed than our counterparts, cats and dogs. They have uh, significantly less taste buds compared to us. I think we're around like 9,000. Their cats around 470, and uh, dogs around 1,700 taste buds. So you can see the difference in variation. It's not about taste for them. It is for us. In our experience, we like to put that on them, right? And say, well, we like it steak, so they must like it too, the way it tastes. So they'll enjoy it this way. It's not always, that's not really the reality. It's probably more factual that they like the way it smells. Absolutely. And I think it's also very unique to think about the fact that even us as humans, we have a lot of taste buds. We don't have as many sensors as far as what we're able to smell. Correct. Yet, we, our appetite is still very stimulated by what we smell. You walk into a house, somebody's making some you know, pies and stuff, you're like, mmm, I'm gonna eat. Yeah. Right? right? Even though that's not our primary sensor. Correct, and as you're talking about the olfactory bulb and the sensors that come with it. I think we're humans are around six million, cats are like 200 million, and dogs are around like 100 million, just off of smell. So they have a whole new world of uh, vision that comes in the form of sense. And we have to understand that. I know we want to empathize with them on how we feel, right? But they feel differently and we just, that's a, a situation we'll never truly engage in or understand because it's just that dynamic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I like to tell people like, when you go to the airport, if you do any international flights, they got dogs that can smell the number of bills you have on you, like the number of notes you yeah. have on you, right? It's like, that's crazy. Right? All sensory. That's, that's really good. Yeah. One of the things with the healthy eating, and sometimes dogs are required to eat a different diet, um, one of those situations usually comes with allergies, right? I got a dog that's very allergenic. Um, so we put this, pull this video here for you, take a quick look at it, and you'll see that this dog has some issues. Coco's allergies were out of control. It would happen every so often, and sometimes it would get really bad. But I could never figure out why. After a bunch of vet visits and tests, we found out she was allergic to over 20 different things. So I had to carefully monitor what she ate. I had to clean her every week. And we had to find new pads to walk around in the neighborhood. After about six months, there was significant progress. A year later, and she's mostly itch-free. Yay, Coco! I love that case. It's pretty impressive, right? Like, very, very. And, I mean, it all starts with an allergy test, right? That's why I, I do that all day. Like, I will test your pet to find out exactly what's going on. Tell me more about that. How does that work? Yeah, so certain allergy tests, the one I'm familiar with is one called Nextmune. And uh, we grab a sample of blood and we send it off for immunoglobulin checks. Those are sensitivities to see what your body is highly reactive to. And they test them through a variation of food, environmental or regional allergens that are very specific to your pets. If they light up like a Christmas tree, you get in a booklet, say, hi, my name is Ragnar. You didn't know this, but this is who I am. This is what I've been allergic to, run it. And then the things you avoid, you avoid. The things you can't avoid, you try to manage, right? And the things that you don't want to put in my mouth, don't put it in my mouth. And I'll usually do just fine. I tell people all the time, I'm allergic to cantaloupe. I don't die, <laughs> but if I eat it, that's half our conversation, right? Now imagine only eating cantaloupes all your life. You're gonna be miserable <laughs> because my throat will swell in the middle of the night if I eat it at nighttime. And I'll do that subconsciously and I'll sell them in some trouble, right? Imagine these pets and they, and their form of itchiness is in the form of licking their paws chronic ear infection, shaking their head, their feet are their sweat glands. So when they lick their paws, it's like athlete's feet, right? I know we had that one episode of Kiss of Death. Yeah. Yeah, so all that bacteria is on those paws that they're just spreading, sweating, and repeat. And if I'm doing that, let's say I usually ask questions like, out of 10, what's, what, what, where level are we at? Oh, seven out of 10, eight out of 10. That's like 80% of the day you're sucking on those feet. Right, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah and, and, those, and those tests, when they show you because once again, this, like, this episode is very specific about dietary issues and what they show you is certain things that they can eat. You mentioned Ragnar, which is my dog. I actually did this test with my dog. He actually was allergic. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we'd normally find in dog foods that you can't eat, which pushed him onto a prescription diet. For sure, for right? sure, which are limited ingredients. 
And a lot of those are hydrolyzed proteins, which means it's already broken down to a micromolecule so that these macromolecules aren't so aggressive and the body doesn't respond so defensive, right? Because that's where the histamine response, which is the itchiness, right? So I think um, when it comes to these situations and you, and you do get that allergy test that tells you what I can and can't eat, you got a guide for it, right? You said prescription diets. Some owners, if, you, if you're capable financially and you can do this continually, go buy the food, right, if you want to. I'm not gonna judge you, but prescription diets to help or formulate to help assist in cases like this to make life more convenient for everybody. And you're seeing results, correct? Right, right. Right, but the moment you get off that, that spectrum, you cheat the system, we go right back to flaring up because that's the allergy, and that's just what you're hypersensitive to. But there's gonna be some problems still with pets um, because, again, we said the healthy food isn't necessarily the one that's most appealing, so sometimes that particular food doesn't really appeal to your pet, especially yeah. if he's used to eating something else. You've been sure. giving him hamburgers when you've been coming home from McDonald's killing yeah. yourself, um, you want to kill your dog with you, so you've been giving it the same thing. Yeah. Um, but now that's what he's looking for, and he's like not really into the prescription medicine. Exactly. Well, you know, prescription diet. You know, it, it is basically prescri prescribed because it has limited ingredients for the spe specificity in your case. Um, it's twofold. So not only do I have to make sure the pet eats it, I have to make sure the owner is okay with feeding it because they already have habitual chronic conditions that they know I'm used to doing this. If I give you that prescription, but your wife decides to continue these treats or give hot dogs occasional because she just has to love your pet like that, it's gonna cancel out. And you're gonna say, I'm spending all this money on this food, it's not working. Dr. Owens, you don't know what you're talking about. I paid for all this booklet information, it's not working. How dare you guys, I'm going somewhere else. Wait a minute, we didn't collect all the facts here. So I always make sure to assess the family because it's a family affair. It's not just you taking care and loving this pet, it's everybody. And I like your story, I gotta share this one too, because when it wasn't working, we had to troubleshoot some more. And guess what? Unc has two pets. <laughs> one's on prescription diet, one's not. Because we talked about taste versus <laughs> sensory, we found out Ragnar was having flare-ups because he was going behind eating her, Lucy's, feces, which was on the other food. So it's partially undigested, digested food. And again, it's not the taste, it's the smell. It's a great segue into this. Look at this picture right here. That, this is what Doc's talking about right now. Um, it's just the fact that the the dogs have so many sensors yeah. that, that my dog was actually smelling in the feces of the other dog the undigested food and it stimulated him to eat it Ingest right it. he ingested it because he was still smelling it. Yeah. And that's how strong their sense of smell is yeah. and what right? happened we flared right back up and if we didn't have that conversation I'm looking like the bad guy because all you guys want is the client is results and I understand it. Not even just results once or twice, you want consistent results on a chronic problem that can flare up again. So those are my pain points and that's why Enjoyable was created, right? To help appetite stimulate this pet in a process that says, hey, this is what I need to eat. Owners seeing good success rates. The smell is stimulating everyone to do right by the situation and everyone wins. Let's take a quick break and then we're gonna come right back and we're gonna break down into that Enjoyable and why Doc made it.